Hi and welcome to the show Podium and this week we're on session 061 and it's about a webinar that we held with the lovely multi-instrumentalist Nick Bottini and our guest on the webinar is the lovely Paul Austin. So Nick Bottini is a multi-instrumentalist, consultant and performance coach. Nick studied at Leeds University, the Franz Litz Hochschule für Musik in Weimar and the Royal Northern College of Music in Manchester. He has worked as a freelance musician as well as head of music in many London schools. As a workshop leader and public speaker, Nick has shared the inside-out understanding of the mind with musicians, international sports people, business people and many others. For over 10 years, he has worked at various levels of the music industry, from school children and adult beginners to child prodigies, competition winners, music college students and top professionals. If you'd like to get hold of Nick Bottini after the show, you can do so via his website on www.bestsaxophonistwebsiteever.com. So we're just going to go straight over to that webinar now wonderful that you're here so would you like to just tell us a little bit about yourself yeah it's great it's great to be here Denise and thanks for having me um yeah so I'm I was trained as a musician I was originally trained as a violinist and uh, along the way uh, I went into to music teaching and learned other instruments as well and I, I um gig professionally as a as a saxophone player predominantly now I kind of made the, the switch to play saxophone um and in my journey to um, become want to become a better musician, I got curious about psychology and how the mind works and and how that relates to performance. And that's uh, what I'm spending most of my time doing now is is working as a as a, a coach with musicians and um, performers. And I've just written a book about the the, the thing that that, that topic um, as well. Oh, that's lovely. Lovely. Good. Well, we're really excited that you're on the show and we're really excited to hear more about what it is that um, we both point to in our teachings and our coaching um, that helps people to be able to perform, if you like, with a, with a much higher uh, or much more expanded level of freedom. Yeah, let's do... Let's get into that. But before I do, Paul, is there anything that you particularly would like um, Nick or myself to cover during this session? Because it, it's, um, it's great that you have us to yourself. <laughs> it's very lucky, yes. So uh, I've got a number of questions for Nick, and a lot of them are around Jacob, actually. <laughs> no, I'll, I will ask a few questions about Jacob, because you obviously know him. Uh-huh. And um, I don't know how much you know him, Denise, but uh, Jacob is... Um, on the border of being um, beyond genius, I think. I don't know if you'd agree with that, Nick, but he is um, quite a phenomenal musician. Um, But I've got lots of questions. I'm a keen amateur musician, um, and I've played with a very limited palette because I don't read and I don't understand, you know, I know the language of music in a very basic sense, but I don't know the language of music to your level. Um, so I'm just very intrigued, particularly in a jazz improv style, to understand some of the mechanics of being able to get to the kind of level that one can get to if that's the kind of music you're playing and you're able to play. Um, so there's, there's lots of things going on there, and it is about performance. But I've also got a question for Denise, I think, which is to do with the approach, which is, is it listen, learn, adapt, solution, deliver the solution, or is it come with the three Ps and work with the individual with the three Ps? That, I think, is my big question for you. Oh, oh that's a beautiful question, actually, Paul. So, okay, so first of all, I suppose, the thing that's coming up for me, Paul, is the three principles in and of themselves are not it. So they're actually pointing people to this intelligence that there is behind life. And it's, 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 it's an explanation, really, of how it is that we get to experience life as human beings. So it's not about getting this 
these three principles, understanding them intellectually and then applying those to our coaching? No, because that's conceptual and that is what the industry, basically the sort of self-help industry is, is, is full of because it's dealing with the form, it's dealing with our experience, it's dealing with coping with strategies for a better experience. What the th- principles understanding is all about is going underneath all of that form and starting to get, if you like, behind our eyeballs of our perspective and seeing what's going on. Like in a deeper sense, how is it we get to experience life? What's the nature of it? And when we start to see that, we get an insight and we get a shift around what's actually going on. And then we show up as coaches with a deeper understanding of what's going on. And we are much more, the impact of that is that we're much more in tune with what it is that person in front of us is up against. Like we'll we'll profoundly know that they're up against their thinking in the moment and nothing else. And to them, it doesn't look like that. To them, it looks like they're up against performing an audience, which looks scary, uh, results, world rankings. It looks like they're up against people liking them, the people liking their products. But actually, all they're really up against is how seriously they're taking their thinking in the moment, which is always changing. Mm -hmm. So when we start to see that, Paul, we start to uncover this resilience, this innate mental health, we call it, or innate resilience in us as human beings. And I like to, like to say that we're just creative machines. We're creating experience all the time from the inside out. Like we're projecting experience into the world. And that's phenomenal. And I didn't, I had a sense of it before, but I thought it was like, it, it came to me by sort of chance, a chance zone match, you know, where I go in the zone and it felt effortless. But then I realized, oh my goodness, you know, we are that creative potential. And the only thing that prevents us from feeling that and having complete access to that is all of this noise that's going on here in our personal thinking. And I didn't know that. <laughs> like it's a, it's a deeper knowing. So hopefully, that's, is that, is that answered your question a little bit? Yeah, I, I think so. I think, it, you know, it's very important, um, this business of models and tools and what you, you bring and what you offer to, to a coachee. Um, and if you come better to your coaching assignment, better centered uh, and better understanding, then that, that means you've got a better chance of delivering the engagement. And that all makes perfect sense to me. What the three perspectives are, I haven't grasped yet, but the concept of actually being better uh, centered and, and able to create the coaching space makes a lot of sense to me. All right. Well, that's lovely. Okay, so Nick, why don't you have a stab at that question as well, right? Yeah. Oh, let's let's ask this question. Like, how was life before you had any understanding of these three Ps as a musician? Very, very personal. Very, very... But like a lot was depending on me being able to prove something. That to, so to me, it was, I was trained in a system of grade exams and uh, doing you know, GCSE music and then A-level music and doing a, a performance uh, course where I was trying to get a certain amount of marks to prove that I got a certain class of degree and all that kind of thing. And, and it, no one really told me that my musical achievements and me weren't the same thing. Mm. No one really told me that um, there, there was 
this being <laughs> before I considered myself to be a musician or an achiever or a, a learner um, or someone that manifests stuff in the world. I, I, that had been lost to me. So every time it, it felt that if I ever succeeded in something, that was because I was a success. Or if I thought that I failed at something, that was because I was a failure at that thing or I didn't, ha I didn't have that skill. Um, and th this understanding has kind of like turned the, the lens around and instead of looking at the, the products of what I, you know, I create or a client creates you know, in the world of, of stuff that's being done, um, it kind of shifts the focus on, well, what, what creates my experience of me as a musician or me as where, where's that idea of failure coming from um and and looking at the fact that it is a creation um and what does that creating of that experience it um you know, bef before there was a constant need to sort of for me to strive to keep validating myself and proving that I'm valid and proving that I'm okay and proving that I belong in this club of professional musician compared to the big boys who play at this venue or have, you know, have done this album with this person or, you know, there's, there's always something somewhere else to get to. And, you know, no matter how, no matter what the grade or, or, or you know, no matter the prestige, there's always a reason to, to hate yourself for some, for some reason, you know, also feel invalid for, for whatever reason. Um, I, I still have that experience sometimes, but it's not the foundation of everything that I do anymore. Um, that's, hu that's huge to me because it's, it now feels like I can take risks and, f and, and follow my nose kind of creatively or, or in business or whatever, because, because I want to, not because I, um, I feel I have to prove something or, you know, and I'm also not fearful of, of, of failing because I know that I can't be diminished in any way um, because my music is not me, you know, that, and that's, that's such a widespread thing in the music industry. And, I, and I'm sure it's the same with lots of other domains as well. Um, that, you know, success equals I'm a success. And, and that's, that's a misunderstanding you know, it's, it's very widespread, but it, it's just purely a misunderstanding of how we work, you know. Um, so, so, you know, to answer the question of how it was beforehand, it was, I thought it was all about me trying to prove that I was good enough, really. And that, that's not, it's not, it's not the, the raison d'etre for everything anymore. It's, it's a very different kind of um, landscape. It, it feels I'm, I'm a lot freer, you know. I still feel like I'm failure sometimes and I still feel like I'm frightfully proud when I do something well or whatever. I have those ego -y moments, of course, um, and they come, come up regularly, but the, the foundation of how, how that all works, that's very, very different. You know, and that's, that's kind of the direction that I point people in because it just fr frees them up because they, they've got nothing to lose quite literally. There's nothing to lose by having a go and playing full out and making mistakes and all that kind of thing, you know? Just lovely. And you know what occurs to me, Nick, is there's a big difference, isn't there, in coaching of telling people, on one hand, telling people and giving advice to people about, you know, you don't need to be worried and, you know, just go out there and enjoy yourself and, you know, um, it'll be all right on the night type stuff. And there's a big difference, isn't it, in, in any, any of that um, lending confidence to your performers versus them seeing that for themselves, profoundly seeing something that allows their natural capacity to perform to just flow. And that's the difference. And I love the... Um, I think I first heard it from Jamie Smart, actually, to give him the credit for it, is that he talks about the, this being implication-based as opposed to application-based. So in the conceptual world of coaching, 
we would be applying all sorts of techniques to quieten the mind and to allow us to perform, you know, that, that performance start to flow through us. Whereas this understanding, when we start, to, when we see something and we profoundly get an insight around it, and it's a bit about an aha moment, really. It's kind of, wow, you may see that. And, it's, and then suddenly you arrive at a space where it just happens. And you don't need to work on your thinking because you don't take it seriously anymore. Mm. Like, can you imagine not taking your thinking seriously? That was not an option for me. For 25 years in performance sport as a national athlete and as a national coach, like I had no understanding that I didn't have to take my thinking seriously. Because as Nick said, when I went out onto the court and performed, I thought that I was my performance. And that here's the other thing, that my well-being was contingent on a good performance. Mm. <laughs> like it was wrapped up in it. And that's not true. Because human beings are innately healthy. We are, our well-being is always intact and it can never be broken. We're always okay. And then we get to experience life via this power of thought, which is one of the principles. We bring thought to life via this power of consciousness. And another word for consciousness is just awareness. And then that projects our content of our world, like that, pro that projects our perspective. And the whole energy of it all and the whole intelligence of all of it, we call the power of mind, the principle of mind. And that's an explanation of what's going on. And when you don't see that, you have all sorts of belief systems going on that you are the performer and if you fail then, then 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 you've got to deal with your experience because somehow you are that performance and that's not true because experiences are coming and going performances are coming and going and perspectives are coming and going and we are this deeper intelligence behind life. We are nature, which is forever changing. And it's a constant. The, 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 the fact of thought is a constant. We, are, we can rely on the fact that we will get another thought along the way. And it's, it, it, it's, in, it's, what, it's very, it's very, it's almost invisible because we can't, we almost, we get our feelings, don't we? And, and then we, we don't know really what it is we're thinking. A feeling is there, but we are actually only feeling our thinking in the moment and nothing else. And it really looks like we're feeling the world. And that's not true. It looks like that. It's not true because we can see that after a performance, say you, you, you had a great performance, you know the euphoria of it will wear off. The same with a match, you know, the euphoria of it will wear off and, or the disappointment of a loss will wear off. Well, if it was coming from the situation, how come it changes? And the only reason your feeling state changes is because it, your thinking changes. And that's really powerful. It's really helpful for people to see that. It's funny that there's this kind of cosmic joke playing out, this, this funny kind of setup that, 
we we have an experience of our performance or of our life and, and it really compellingly looks like it's working um you know like from this outside world making us feel a certain way like and by outside world i mean like my achievements or or the weather or the way the the way that a particular performance goes or whatever, and that we're at the mercy of those um, external events. And, it, and it's really, really compelling. But the, the joke is, you know, exactly like you were saying very beautifully, that, that it's, it's what's behind the, the scenes that's actually the most useful thing to know, that, that there is something generating our experience of that world of the performance of of life and it's the the fact that it's being generated that's the root of the of the feelings that we either like or don't like you know and if we make the mistake of kind of navigating our life by how we're feeling rather than navigating it based on how it's working then we're at the mercy of this illusion rather than the facts of the matter. And this is what I love about this, you know, because it, to some people it can sound, um, you know, sometimes it can sound like it's, uh, spiritualism or, or, or something, um, that's, that's kind of non tangible, but it's, it's extremely tangible and extremely practical because it's grounded in principles in the same way that there are, um, you know, scientific principles behind, uh, the way that, physics works or the way that chemistry works and it just works that way all the time and because of that it's predictable and it's reliable um and knowing how say gravity works or knowing how um i don't know fluid dynamics works it works the same every time because of that that's the way that it works you know it's not the the products of that system that you're, you're dealing with it's the it's the nature of how it works and that's that's powerful because if you want to change something, it's really, it's just really good to to be hanging out in reality rather than like you were saying at the beginning, Denise, like theories and concepts and belief systems, um, having the principles underlying the human experience is the most leveraging thing that I've found for not only performance, but for life, you know, is if we know what's going on, um, we're not acting superstitiously anymore. Um, and it's innocently done. And when you accuse somebody of being superstitious, they go, no, of course I'm not. It's, it's grounded in what I'm, what I'm seeing, what I'm experiencing. But it is superstitious, you know, if we, if we don't know what's, what's causing our feelings, you know. Thought. Thought is causing our feelings, not the things we're feeling about. It's ludicrously simple, but it, it's, it's good to know um, because there's a whole lot of freedom associated with it um, and potential and, you know, the capacity to have, you know, a kind of fresh start, you know, and reconsider who you even think you are. You know, that's, that's huge. It's been, it's been huge for me and it's, it's, you know, I know that a lot of people have had that kind of, that kind of um, life-changing experience because it's, all the all the rubbish that we've been telling ourselves, you know, like I can do this or I can't do that or what have you. It's you know, knowing that all those beliefs are thought generated beliefs, not my my potential generated yeah. beliefs or achievement generated beliefs or um, you know, it's not based in fact, it's based in thought generating it. Um it like, it's like wiping the slate clean, you know. Mm. Oh, I love that. Like wiping the slate clean. I, that is really how I felt when I came across this understanding is, and slowly, well, I mean, it wasn't, I mean, I did have a kind of epiphany on, on some levels or for some things, but slowly I've just, I don't know, it's like the weight just sort of comes off your shoulders that, you know, the, the, there is no right and wrong. We're making that up in our own minds every day. <laughs> and so we can be free to explore life. We can be free to explore what's, come, what's um, inspiring us with nothing on it. 
Like we can just go, oh, you know what? This is such fun and, and go for it. And our well-being is always intact. Like we're always going to be okay. As a human being, there is this incredible resilience in us which gives us this understanding that when we fall out of our, our personal thinking, this resilience is there. And we don't, we, we just know that we're okay. And that in that knowing, we can just carry on regardless of however we feel. And even if we feel rubbish, and I've had lots of parenting moments like that, <laughs> um, it's just something that's telling me, it, this is not you. This is what you're experiencing in this moment. And that's so helpful because now I can't blame anybody or anything for the way I feel, which means I'm not going to behave badly so much <laughs> because I have the chance, I have the opportunity to catch myself before that behavior happens and, 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 and have to make amends and have to change stuff and have to apologize. And, and, and I know that's okay to apologize. We all get caught up, but if I'm, I've got the capacity and the resilience to come right back to source at any moment. In one thought, I can see my experience as thought created, thought generated, thought created. That's resilience. It's, and it's massive in terms of performance because it gives us a freedom To just get on with it. To just play. Exactly the title of your book, Nick. That's good. I should, I should take that. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's, fu it's really funny. It's really funny because, you know, we, we're so wrapped up in our own experience that we don't notice that we're making the experience. You know, I've seen... I've seen literally hundreds of people, you know, students and, and parents and adults um, sort of walk through my classroom door when I was a music teacher with really beautifully made beliefs about who they were as a musician, like how valid they were or how, how invalid they were. And they'd, they'd go to great lengths to apologize for why they didn't have the background that they should have had. It's like, well, I haven't really studied properly or I, I, I haven't... Um, uh, I haven't done my grade five theory yet or my family isn't musical and, they, they, and they, they're, they're true maybe. Um, but, you know, as soon as someone starts singing or sits down at a piano, even if it's like day one, lesson one, then that inbuilt capacity to express life in whatever way makes sense to that person is just there you know and, and as as they kind of let go of the stories then they kind of give themselves permission if it's a piano to kind of make a sound that doesn't sound good you know woe betide a musician that makes a sound that doesn't sound good no one's gonna die it turns out if you make a bad sound and learn something in the process it might it might be you um able to turn it into a nicer sound but it's it's just going to happen and then it's gone but it doesn't mean uh whether you're a proper musician or an improper musician or or anything else it's just an experience you know it's just an experience to to, to sit down and, and to, to play or to sing or, or, or what have you and that's all life is it, it's an experience and and it feels like that experience we're having has a meaning. But the only place that meaning is coming from is us, you know, is, is what we truly are, which is this formless, you know, 
spiritual being, this formless essence that creates this experience. And, and given half a chance, whatever needs to express itself through whatever medium, whether it's music or sport or anything or poetry, or, you know, it doesn't matter what the medium is. It's nature is to express to, to to bring stuff into being, to make stuff, to 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 play and to have fun and to be curious and uh, spontaneous in the moment. That's just the nature of it, you know. And it, as well as creating music or poetry or anything else, it, it can create all the all these beliefs that then suddenly become very compelling cages for us to keep us kind of locked into these little creations that we've made and. It's it's a beautiful thing that we have this kind of creative um, essence, and if we understand it, then it's not possible to be tricked by it. Um, so it doesn't make sense to not have a go at playing a new instrument at the age of seventy three, if that's what you want to do, or, or um, you know, or to take a career change and take a bit of a risk, to, you know, and, and feel slightly uncomfortable about what the future is going to hold. You know, it doesn't. If that's what you're being called to do, um, and we, we've always got this kind of sense of what 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 keeps bugging us, what what needs to be done, what's the itch that needs to be creatively scratched or whatever. Um, uh, it kind of takes the fear away of us, you know. God, what does it mean if I fail at it? It means nothing. <laughs> it means it was an experiment, you know. Um, so, yeah, it's, fun, it's funny, particularly in the field of music, because people often, you know, there's so much, um, so many myths about, you know, creative people versus non-creative people or musicians versus non-musicians and it's just that's just meaningless really it's a creation i mean i, I know what it means i know what they are getting at is that there are some people who do lots of music and some people who do less um but the mechanism by which anybody does it all is the same every single human being has the same creative mechanism um no exceptions you know and that, that's definitely been a huge eye-opener for me because I, 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 training as a musician it was always like well which which group do I belong to where do I fit in the hierarchy am I allowed to call myself professional am I allowed to call myself a real violinist you know and knowing that that whole hierarchy is just total rubbish um yeah it's, it's helpful to be able to talk in those terms sometimes but it's not truth it's not true that, that anybody is um, made of a different essence just because they have a career as a professional musician. That's just not, it's not true. Um, I'm, not, I'm not equally saying that everyone's cut out to uh, do the same career or, you know, because we, we, we find ourselves falling into um, different life paths and I think that's that's for a good reason you know we need variety and, and whatnot but um, but there, there's no hierarchy in terms of creativity or or validity you know um, but it's, it's not how people talk about it at all that's that's the, the polar opposite to how a lot of people in the music industry and sport and education and business it, it's that's how that's how people talk about things. It's, just, it's sorting people into categories and putting them in the boxes and, and all that kind of thing. Um, so it's helpful to know that it's not true. You know? Thank you. So Paul, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm listening with, uh, with very, very intent interest and, and I'm just sort of wrestling with this, this sort of concept that I've had as somebody who's got into coaching and now got my coaching qualification and um, having to have a level of technique to be able to deliver. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about musicians and technique and deliver. And I'm thinking about sports people who are athletes and I'm thinking about elite sports people and um, soccer people now because of the World Cup. And 
if you look at that particular group, and I was very touched by it when I met some Norwegian international players when I was working for a Norwegian company, how they were incredible athletes. They weren't the size of rugby players. They were, they were just athletes. And it's almost like they could be running the 200 metres next week. And it, it's interesting what Nick's saying about sort of everybody can do it and everybody can have their own creativity and it's in their own, on their own terms. But I guess the reality is when it comes to Premier League footballers, they're athletes. When you look at, um, technically, you look at musicians they've got a, and professional musicians, they've got a level of technique. You look at coaches who are good behind the ability and the, the level they get to and, and the, the mastering coaches, there is a level of technique that they've got. And it's this, this really sort of conundrum about um, you, have this, you have this ability as well as the technique, as well as the opportunity, as well as the, I guess, a, mu- a musician, it's to do with the, the mental capacity and the mental ability, but if it's a physical thing like sport. It's to do with technique and their physique and you know, you hear stories about cyclists, elite cyclists who've got lungs, which are, you know, one and a half times normal sizes of lungs. It, it, it's, it's those kind of things which sort of come to mind when it comes to these kind of things. Is, and I'm particularly interested in musicians, is this ability to, to free themselves from the fact that they've got this com- competitive structure around getting to the best schools, uh, you know, getting their grade eight. And the sort of tyranny of competition that we have in our sort of systems and allowing people to be taught to a kind of level where, okay, yes, there's the technical side of things, but I'm not going to teach you to do the grade eight, but that's about 10% of what I'm going to do is to teach you. I'm going to teach you to be, to free your mind and to be a musician. And I guess it's probably the same with, with sports people as well. And soccer people, for example, they'll, they'll be in the right physical mold, but a good coach will take them and say, it's not about the outcome. It's about teaching you to free your mind. And I think it's probably the same with lots of different things. And I guess with coaches as well, and what I've learned about it is, it's this business of, okay, yes, you have to have some technique and you have to have some basic understanding, but it's also the business of challenging yourself and freeing your mind. And what I'd, what I'd love to hear from, from Nick is, from the musician's perspective, when you think of the super geniuses, what is it that's, that's, that's their, their essence and their core that's got them to that super performance level? And it's the same with netball players as well. You know, I saw the England-Australia game and the Commonwealth Games, which was just phenomenal. <laughs> Wasn't it? <laughs> what, what was the mindset there? I mean, technically, they're, they're good. Australia, technically, they're good. But something was happening at a certain level where it just, it just dropped out and it just, they were able to just express themselves. And that was just... That, it's that super performance. And I think about, I, I don't know if, if Nick will remember, the, um, the, the Manchester United side of, of um, the late 90s, they, they were just phenomenal. Absolutely, because they were performing at that level of freedom and understanding and capability where they were just, they were beyond elite, really. They were just fantastic. And it's, it's the whole thing about freeing your mind and getting to that level, which I think is what you're saying is, not so much worrying about the outcome, but being, in essence, a team of people who are allowing each other to be free mm. is, is, uh, is what makes it all work. Mm. Well, it strikes me that when, in any domain, when someone's really excelling and making it look effortless, um, that th- there's, a, there's a real degree of that being being their internal experience you know that that they like we say about uh, having a a flow experience or, or whatever that that even means really that there's there's no room for a, a load of judgments and thinking and 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 um sort of limiting uh beliefs be, just being there all, all the time you know uh, People, um, people perform from all kinds of different head spaces as well. You know, I think that's, that's um, kind of important to say. But the, 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 G, the genius business, you know, I, I, don't, 
I don't know what I believe about that really, you know, because, you know, you, you can take, say somebody with extremely fine ears that have perfect pitch or something. Um, and I don't have, I don't have perfect pitch in the same way that, um, uh, that someone like Jake, Jacob Collier has got it. Um, although it's, it's kind of, um, got better over, over the years. Um, but I've heard all sorts of musicians called geniuses. And I don't know, you know, we, we, we come up with various different ways of, of putting them in that category. Um, which is, you know, it's helpful to kind of piece together a schema for ourselves when we're like trying to achieve a better level of performance. That's, that's, that's helpful. But in terms of it being a, in terms of them being a separate breed or in terms of them being, um, being, being separate at the, at the essence of what they are. I, I suppose it's the, it's the core, it's the root cause, I suppose, that I'm, I'm talking to, not necessarily the, the products, you know, because the, the truth is, you know, like, like you said, um, Paul, that, you know, some people have got longer fingers than others. Some people have got different builds to other people. That's just a fact of, of life. There's no amount of clear mindedness that's going to make me, um, you know, have a, have a, a shorter neck and be maybe slightly better built for, for playing the violin in an ideal kind of physiology. But there's also countless examples of people with um, slightly less than ideal physical attributes for a particular instrument who against all the odds seemingly take to it like a duck to water. So it's very easy to make judgment after judgment after judgment about there being categories or there about there being people who are built for it or the reasons. And we can often not even notice that we're making those judgments and assessments and, and, you know, and, and all those judgments and assessments are essential. Um, it's a useful tool to be able to, to have, but to know that we're thinking it up, that's, that's helpful because it means that, you know, if, if I, if I thought that I was, you know, not in, not in the genius category, um, by birth, um, I'd have a different relationship with, with music to how I feel I do now, which is that, you know, genius or um, being, being gifted is just, it shows up in different ways for different people. And I'm, I'm not trying to negate the, the value of putting lots of work in and um, maybe following certain uh, approaches to study or you know like how you how, how long you practice for and what order you do things in i think there's a there's a place for for planning and and, and kind of understanding how um you know bodies works and, and brains work but i think when we when we mistake a a symptom for a, for a cause we then get into into trouble. So we can look at a musical genius and look at their output, whatever that whatever form that is, and think, think oh well, I, I've judged them to be a genius, and it must be the genius that caused it. When in fact, it was something much more ordinary. Actually, um, you know, it, it, I see moments of genius in, in a in a child making their first musical sounds and it's humble and it's very very mundane it's very very average and that's something that strikes me about really world-class performers they don't seem very bothered about the fact that they're so brilliant most genuinely you know it's just okay well it's just it's just every day and, and average and so uh, you know, genuinely, I th you know, I think for, for many of these world class performers, it feels very average because I think they they sense that it is, and I, I think it's actually, in many ways, helpful to look in what's in the direction of what's average and universal, rather than what separates people. And I know it's very tempting to look in the direction of what separates us because that, that's that's helpful to kind of figure out, figure out our own path that's personal to us. Um, but in terms of, you know, the us and them, are there being two different categories? I think we're, we're, we're all, um, we all have access 
to, to genius and it will take different forms, you know, and my genius will, will not be being a concert piano player, a concert pianist. Um, but, but that doesn't mean I don't have access to a very relevant style, you know, type of genius for, for me and the same for everybody else. Um, so I, I think looking in the direction of what's the same between people helps us to kind of un unlock a bit more of what's already there. Um, that's the, probably the best way that I can explain it. Wow, what a wonderful show. And I'd just like to say a huge thank you to Nick Bottini for being our very special guest on this webinar and podcast show. And a very special thank you also to our attendee, uh, Paul Austin who had some beautiful um, contributions to that conversation. So thank you again, Paul. So if you'd like to get hold of Nick Bottini, you can do so via his website on www.bestsaxophonistwebsiteever.com. And if you'd like to get hold of myself, I'd love to hear from you. My website is www.class-performance.com. And or my email is denise.holland at class-performance.com. So that just leaves me to say thank you so much for listening in. And I look forward to learning and sharing with you again soon. Thank you. Bye bye. <laughs>